Welcome to the Chasing Something podcast with me, Lorinda Pretorius. Here we get real and raw about the struggles and the joys of being a young adult following Jesus in a post-Christian world. Join me as I engage in tough, controversial and highly relevant conversations to enable you to thrive in your chase. to today's episode so we've come so far you know this is the last episode of season one of the chasing something podcast and for this very special episode firstly for those of you who aren't listening and watching on instagram tv or youtube yo i put in so much effort for you to have a video it is a lot like if you saw the technical things going on here right now it is so rough but anyway another special thing about this episode is that i will be sharing my testimony but you know if you know me personally you know that i can go on a lot of different tangents you know and not always stick to the story so <laughs> i was really smart I brought one of my really close friends on here to help me tell the story by guiding me with con with questions and like just guiding the conversation. So I have my friend Sabrina here with me. We did a discipleship training <laughs> school together. Um, so we were together in YWAM basically um, and she is great. She's the best and she's funny. <laughs> and she's such a great dancer. Oh my gosh, I just watched this video the other day of us dancing together on DTS and I was that one who did not know what I was doing. Like, it was so rough. Um, mm, yeah, it was at our graduation. Like, it was... <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad I don't care what people think about me because, wow. Um... <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to let Sabrina just quickly introduce herself and then we'll get into it. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Sabrina. Um, I just graduated TV production in London and now I'm just living that uncertain recent graduate life in lockdown and that's my full story. That's everything. <laughs> so yeah. You also used to do YouTube. You can share about that. Okay, but actually... I really want to start doing YouTube again. Like I literally, I have so much filmed that I just need to edit it. So watch out for that. <laughs> mm. But editing is like the worst part. No offense. Well, you opinion. know what happened in uni is I would film a lot because I just loved filming. But then because I was filming and editing at uni for projects, I would get home and I just, I did not want to yeah. edit my own videos. So the struggle is real, but we'll get there <laughs> yeah it's all on you now now you get to be the interviewee so or interviewer that's what i mean sorry interviewer you're my interviewee <laughs> okay so should we just start with like just tell us about your childhood like your parents are divorced like when did that happen how did that affect you all of that so basically i um grew up in a christian home um my parents are both christian and they got divorced when i was i think six but from like four years old they were kind of separated so i don't have like any happy memories of my parents together and then i have like a younger brother who's three years younger than me um and yeah, so they got divorced when I was six. But then when I was like nine years old, we moved. So I moved with my mom to this small town. I was already living in a pretty small town. I moved to an even smaller town. 
Um, and we lived there for a year. Then she got married and then, okay, we continued living there. Um, and I, yeah, then I got three stepbrothers as well. And I was the only girl. And I love my stepdad. My stepdad is great. At the beginning, it was like kind of weird and like it was an interesting situation. Um, but yeah, I did not like the place I was in, like the, the um, town it was not great. So I really didn't like primary school. You know, the thing is, <laughs> I've always been an outsider. Like, I've always been that other girl. <laughs> like, it really doesn't matter where I am. Like, <laughs> I just always have this... Yeah. Being the one that's standing out from everyone else. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think a lot of it it has to do with my parents because firstly they're both really interesting people and they they don't think like they're outside the box like my dad is an alternative oncologist and my mom well doesn't really matter what career she's doing but what she's passionate about is like organic food and like how to eat yourself healthy and like i don't know just like more alternative routes to health and just life in general um and the other thing is that when i was younger my mom and my dad did not agree on anything like honestly after they got divorced i was just like i don't even know how these people were married like how they they just see life so differently even though now there's more similarities but especially in that time and so my brother and i we didn't have the luxury to just um kind of follow the way or the thinking of our parents you know like a lot of people i'm not saying that you don't think for yourself but there is a clear culture in your family that is accepted and a way of thinking that you just automatically kind of um take on Be exactly because that's how you're formed that's how you're socialized but my two different ways of um life because when i was with my mom i was in this small town where we had a like huge yard because everyone there has like huge yards and like there's chickens and we're in the garden and there's very few electronics and then i got to my dad's house and he is like more on the wealthy side and like we don't really have a yard and there's a lot of electronics but also just like the way they see success and stuff like that um or the way they saw like politics and life very much differed and so we had to choose like what do we believe in um also because when you're my mom's side is a bit more chilled but like my dad's side i mean you need to know what you believe like they <laughs> you just really need to because they will bombard you with like so many questions like why are you saying this okay but why no, I don't care what your friend said or your mom said. Like, why do you think this? Like, you need to think for yourself. Since I can remember, like, we had conversations about the world. And, like, we never just had conversations about, you know, our family or something. It's always like, oh, well, what's going on in the world? And um, we, my dad has American citizenship. Um, and my brother and I do, too, because of him. Um, and so we've always been very involved in like American politics because we get to vote. So like what's going on there? What we what do we think about that? And also just the way it affects, um, you know, South Africa and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm actually, I mean, not that I think divorce is great because I don't. But like I, I can't really remember a time where I was like, I wish my parents were married because... I don't know, I just felt like, you know, it's all I've ever known. Um, yeah, did they fight a lot? Yes, like, it was honestly, it was, like, horrible. No offense, parents, if you're listening to this. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like fighting in all relationships completely is unavoidable, but then mm -hmm. when it's almost all the time, it's very different, and it surprises you when you're older to look back and be like, wow, like that affected me more than I ever thought that it did. The fact that my parents fought a lot. Yeah. I don't know. For me, I, 
I'm lucky in the sense that I never had this feeling, oh, I never want to get married because like everybody gets divorced. And I was just like, I'll never get divorced. I was just like, I won't be that person. But also, like, if you listen to the story of my parents and like later on they like spoke to me about it, um, you realize how the small things built up until like a big moment and then they decided to get divorced. Um, and actually, like, I've spoken to my mom about it a lot and I was like, you know, relationships, like, you have to work on it. And she was just like, you know, when I got married, like, that, like, we didn't know that. She was like, it was, just, you just kind of accepted that, like, your, the wife might be unhappy, but, you know, like, if the husband brings in enough money or, like, it's just, like, it's just how it is. Like, there wasn't a lot of discussion, especially because it's Afrikaans and, like, super conservative. So, like, when we talk about my sexual sexuality a bit later like a lot of things in my family was just like not necessarily talked about very well and and I don't completely blame my parents like I yeah because I just understand that where uh the way they grew up these things were never talked about like never it's actually surprising that they kind of raised us well <laughs> like it, it's kind of like wow <laughs> This is a mirror. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny because my mom, especially now, because she um, studied psychology a bit later, and she was like, you know, each time I think about like your childhood, I just, I'm just surprised that you came out so well because like I just messed it up. And I was like, no, <laughs> like you just need to chill. Like no parent is perfect. I understand like it's great that you're, you want to do better or whatever, but like, just chill it's not that bad yes like yeah so i don't know if the fighting really maybe it has affected me but i don't know like um it's weird because it's been such a long time i just kind of and also i'm a conflict person like i love conflict actually not necessarily see conflict isn't necessarily like just yelling um just like any yeah any sort of conflict i <laughs> i really enjoy conflict and because i just see it as an opportunity to grow and usually when people when there's conflict people are being honest and i just appreciate honesty so much so i'd say if anything the divorce just made me realize what i want in life in terms of relationships what i don't want to accept um and how I would not let that happen to me in the future. Yes. Something that I was just thinking about was how you were saying you almost had these two worlds. Like your mm. mom's living was like very natural and let's be healthy and not a lot of electricity, whatever. And then mm. your dad was like wealthy, all the electronics, like yeah. all this stuff. Um, and I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how those two very different worlds affected your worldview and the way that you thought and then how that like set you apart from people in primary school because kids just think what their parents think but mm. you didn't have that like you had to figure out really what you think because your parents think of very different things <laughs> yeah no so you know those people who always relate more to the teachers than the children? I was that person. <laughs> Just because um, even though I was really young, um, I was always more mature than my peer group. And that's obviously also because of like the trauma I had to work through. And like, um, I didn't really touch on that, but my dad was pretty verbally abusive when I was younger. And so that like, that affected a lot of my, I think it affected a lot of my personality. Like I've always been a strong person, but I don't think I would be as strong as I am right now if it wasn't for that experience. Um, which also links to like me being able to take hate or whatever. Cause I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and the thing about like growing up in these two different worlds is that it made me, um, like, I've always been pretty aware of, like, what's going on, but it um, made my worldview even bigger. 
uh, especially when I was in the very small town, that was one of the biggest issues I had with them. I was like, you've never been outside of this town. Like, you've never been outside of this town. There is a world outside there, you know? Um, but also with later on in high school, when I was immersed in this, like, what I call the Pretoria, like, Pretoria East mentality, it's like this, most schools in Pretoria East who claim to be prestige schools, like, they have this very, um, hierarchical, what? Hierarchical? I don't even know how to say this, but they have a hierarchy, a social hierarchy, and it's all about, like, how much money you have and, like, your choices of, like, where you want to go study is, like, Tux or, like, Stellenbosch and maybe some people go to Poch and then it's like you only get to study like medicine or engineering or whatever you can choose outside of the box but then you're that person and i mean i remember even in my matric year like at least five to ten girls having a mental breakdown because of the stress they had in matric i was laughing no offense. I also had a lot of stress, but it was not about academical things. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was always hard for me to relate to either one of those cultures. Because I was like, I am not a part of this. Like, I see, like, my dad was a lot more a part of it. And I think my mom, when she was younger, was. But because she moved to this very small town and, like, she just started a completely different life. I was like okay, well, there isn't just one way. And my mom was always this person who was like, well, I got a degree and now <laughs> I live in this very small town. And she didn't like even do things relating to her degree. And she was like, so is a degree really everything? Because <laughs> so many people are like, just get a degree and you'll be fine. And she was like, I'm just saying there's more than one way to live your life there's more than one journey to success and not everyone's story needs to look the same um my dad was a bit more like there's only going to be one way but my rebellion swayed him i guess yeah so should we talk about the hookup culture in school and how that affected you going into your sexuality a little bit yeah, I mean, I think I only found out about sex when I was like 10 years old, maybe, or 11. I don't know, but like basically we were at school and I think a friend like was speaking about sex and I was like, what? I remember just thinking that if you sleep together on a bed, <laughs> you will get pregnant. I don't know. I don't know, like... <laughs> I just didn't know about sex. Also, I went to a super Christian school, so they did not talk about sex at all. Yes, which is so harmful. Uh, it's definitely one area where Christians stay very quiet and it's yes. very frustrating. Exactly. Um, and then I, I think my mom gave me a book. No, actually, I know she gave me a book, but I can't remember if it was like, I, maybe I asked her. Like, maybe I heard something at school and I was like, oh, can you tell me about this? Um, and then she gave me a book, <laughs> like, explaining, whatever. Um, and so my kind of journey into exploring my sexuality was, well, first I read this book. And then there was this other Afrikaans series that I read. Um, which, I mean, I really don't actually know why my parents let me re like, read that, but I don't think they, like, they didn't know about it. Like, they just thought it was, like, this cute... Yeah, anyway, it was not. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and, like, it was kind of like an Afrikaans gossip girl type of vibe. Like... It was like these people in high school and they were having sex and they were masturbating and it was just like 
but they didn't necessarily word like use the word masturbating i think there was just this scene of like this girl in the bathtub using like i don't know some hair thing you know and i was like yes <laughs> and i'm sure like because i was thinking about this um yesterday because i knew we were recording this and we were gonna talk about like masturbation and whatever and i was thinking like yeah when how did this happen because i remember in my testimony i was like yeah i accidentally discovered it um which thinking back i think it was that book but actually now also now i'm like all the memories are coming back i'm remembering that there was this girl whose parents weren't married and her mom wasn't in the picture and like her dad had this girlfriend and I think like she spoke about masturbating too, but like we obviously didn't know what it was. She was just like, this is what I do and it feels good or something. I don't know. And you're like 10 or 11. Like you don't, I don't know. You don't know much, you know? Um, yeah, like who knows? <laughs> um, so somewhere between that conversation and like reading that book, I was like, oh, well, they're saying this feels really good. Like, maybe I should try it. And then I did. And I was like, I don't know what's happening, but this feels really good. So, yeah, that's kind of like, yeah. And then, again, my memory's a bit blurred. Like, I don't know if this was before or after this. Probably after that. That's when I had, like, my first real encounter okay not real the other encounters i guess was also real but like different so my first like kiss or whatever was with this girl that was my best friend at the time and we um like we were watching the series and there was this scene where it's actually so messed up because <laughs> there's like these twins and the one is married and then the other one who's not married to the guy pretends to be the married one and sleeps with her sister's husband. I know, like that's so messed up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, because it was night and everything. So maybe like it, they didn't, they obviously did not talk. So would he? I don't know. Yeah, so it's just so messed up. But anyway um yeah we were reenacting this i don't know why like again i just don't know why i, I guess that's... i mean i guess if you're like really young and you're not really you don't really know properly what mm. is really going on you're just kind of it's almost the same as like me and my cousin used to reenact high school musical and i would sing to her like she was Troy Bolton and I was Vanessa and we're just doing it because it's fun to reenact things but mm. little do you know it's a little bit deeper than just reenacting a scene from a movie you know yeah I think if this is a warning to parents at all I think you should firstly <laughs> not to blame my parents like I don't blame my parents for this at all um but I mean, I do blame them a little bit, like, but we've, it's chilled now. Like, I've, I speak to my mom about sex a lot, and she still gets awkward about it, but she's like, well, you know what, I'm so glad someone's doing it. <laughs> and she's just like, I would never say this to my mom. So I feel like we've moved a step ahead. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you know, that's all we can do. <laughs> I feel like one day when I have kids, I'm going to be like, Lorinda, help. I don't know what to do. How do I answer these questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, but if this is teaching you anything, please talk to your children about sex. Like, please teach them about sex because I think a lot of these things were out of curiosity. And if I knew properly, more than like, I guess I was reading this book. Sure, it was like anatomy and... They also spoke about masturbation, but like, it's different. Like reading this book about what all these things are and uh, compared to like your mom or dad sitting down with you and saying like, hey, here's this thing. It's called sex. It's beautiful. God created it for like men and women to be one. And there's a lot of things that go into sex and into your sexuality. And like, here's how, here's 
what like being turned on might feel like here's so that you can identify these feelings otherwise you're just like this child not knowing what's going on and you're just like trying anything you don't know what to do with it you don't know yeah you're also confused so you just go with the flow and exactly i mean who can blame yeah. you <laughs> so basically i had this friend then we reenacted this scene or whatever and then I think that it was a weekend, so like, I don't know, we would like make out different times in this weekend, basically. And I remember very distinctly, like afterwards we had this conversation and she was telling me that she does not feel like good about what happened and like we should just never talk about it. And I was like, okay, we'll never talk about it. But I didn't feel weird about it. Like, I didn't feel like, oh, this was so wrong, or like, I just didn't feel anything about it, really. I just left it. Also, I don't really even know where I found out about, like, homosexuality. Maybe it was in that book, but, like, my parents never spoke about it. Like, they were never like, oh, gay people are the worst, or, like, we just didn't speak about it. Really. Uh at least for me, I've learned everything about LGBTQ+, I've learned from Instagram. That sounds bad, but, like, that's the only place that I've ever heard about it. I've only ever had, like, one positive conversation with someone who's gay who actually just discussed with me. Other than that, it's just Instagram and then people being like, oh, so you hate me because you're Christian. And I'm like, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so... Maybe it was more like you had some type of feeling as opposed to like someone taught you what being gay was or whatever. Mm. Yeah, so basically it progressed then. So then I went to high school and like the first two years was very chill. Like honestly, not much happened. I just watched a lot of series. And quite frankly, I was really just like observing this Pretoria East culture, which... You might, like, I don't know, I don't know, my English is running out. But I'm not fond of that culture. That's a point. I'm sorry, I'm just not. But anyway, I was just like, you know, figuring out what do people do? Oh, this is the social hierarchy. Oh, this. Oh, these people think. Oh, these are the jocks. Oh, these people are in control of everything. What? what, what? That's what I was doing. Um, And then in grade 10... I had my first kiss with a guy and it was very unromantic. It was like on this rooftop and I very distinctly like remember him asking me to give him a blowjob and I was like, no, I actually remember preaching to him at that time too. I was like, don't you think that's what's wrong with this generation? <laughs> I love that I do these things. <laughs> when we're younger sometimes we're just like i'm so wise i see everything because <laughs> i was just like firstly i'm not gonna do this and he was like yeah but let's just try and i was like yeah i don't think so <laughs> and i was like this is what's wrong with this no mm -mm. don't you yeah like okay and so that's kind of where it stopped um but then what happened was my life uh became really dramatic <laughs> and then just everything every good conscious thing kind of like went out the door um yeah i just had a lot of drama in high school because obviously i'm this fun person who takes on the jocks or whatever no, just, yeah so i just caused a lot of drama um and as i so i just had this much like, I had so much tension in my life. When I think back, because I think back <laughs> every now and then, then I'm like, how did all this happen? I think, I think I felt trapped. Like, I felt trapped in so many ways. Firstly, my dad was pretty controlling. And so I was looking for some sort of freedom from that. But then I was, like, in constant battle with, like, um, no, so I went to the girls' school. I wasn't specifically um, at war with the girls in uh, my school, but, like, the boys' school across the road. We had a lot of drama. So, but there, 
there were also some girls involved. Like it was just like a power struggle. There was this power struggle. And then I guess like I also had a bit of an internal struggle about like my sexuality. But like when I think about it now, I realize I denied it for a very long time. Like I just remember that. Um, yeah, I mean like uh, an example would be so I was in a, a girl's hostel like if I had friends that I was like very very close to and like really just got me I would like if we would talk I would just think about in my, and in my mind I guess I didn't necessarily think it was normal because that's why I didn't say anything so I would just like not say anything and I would just be like it would be so easy if I could just date this person because they just really get me you know what I'm saying and it's it's this weird thing because I I was kind of like going through it in my mind this week and I was thinking like am I like romantically attracted to girls or like sexually attracted to girls or is it like this personality thing and I I don't actually know I, <laughs> I don't really know like not to be like very vulgar or whatever but like I'm not specifically attracted to like a vagina or a penis like neither of those things are very attractive uh, to, to me but I am I can like I find men attractive more than I find women attractive but I find some women attractive but not always sexually attractive but then attraction is also so relative because when once you get to know someone you or at least for me I can very easily become romantically and sexually attracted to them you know for you, friendship sometimes can easily kind of tip over more into like the now I'm attracted to you side as opposed to uh, just yeah. we're friends. Yes, absolutely. And also, I, I've i always been this person who like I've been friends with guys and girls who I've been attracted to, but it doesn't mean that it will go anywhere. I guess, like, in a way, I'm just, like, very easily attracted to people that I find cool or amusing or whatever. Um, but, yeah. It's also just... I wouldn't know completely because I guess, like, if I want to know completely about how my sexuality really works, I would have to explore it. And, obviously, I'm not willing to do that. And so, I only have the references of what I have explored to say, you know? Yeah. But it's more than just, like, oh, I was hurt by a guy. And so, now this one girl is my comfort. It's more than that. Like, it's not just that type of story, you know? I mean, it's just interesting to me to hear about, like, how you can be friends with someone and that, like, tips into attraction I guess obviously I get it when it comes to guys but for some reason when I think about girls it just doesn't connect for me Mm. so I mean obviously it doesn't happen with every girl right like no (laughs) you know like for example I know your friend Deborah yeah are you like those types of friendships that are very much like Christian friends or whatever do you find sometimes you'll be like oh, actually, I'm really attracted to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I guess, like, it depends. It depends on the person because also, you know, <laughs> I've had this conversation with someone once and they're like, yeah, it's just that um, my, my, or her husband's boss, I think, is gay. And she was like, I don't know if I should feel comfortable or uncomfortable about this. And I was like, okay, something that straight people need to get right about, like, the LGBTQ plus community is that the same way you don't find every guy attractive, like, a gay person does not find every person attractive. Like, that's just not, like, even me, even though I find a lot of people attractive, like, there's a lot of people I do not find attractive at all and also there's a difference between I find you attractive and I am actually attracted to you because sometimes I'm like oh well you're an you're an attractive person but like I'm not attracted at all um and then 
it's also about like where I'm at in my life kind of because um, I found that since I've like decided okay like I don't want to pursue these desires I don't really think about it very often but and I also don't want to like I really don't want to spend like all my time thinking of like oh I could find this girl attractive or like no I just don't want to do that I don't want to waste my thoughts on that um but if I get like if I'm in a bad emotional spot, um, I would have more of these desires. And if I watch things that are very sexual, I also have more of these thoughts. Um, so I would say yes. Do you say when you spend less time with God, like say now you've just been really busy, you haven't been able to spend time with God. Do you find that that's sometimes when you would end up having more of those thoughts? yes definitely like it's a very circumstantial thing it's like obviously i know people will like won't love me comparing this to like a porn addiction but like in a way it is like or even with masturbation right because it did then later become an addiction where i would, like every time at first it was just like oh this feels good but then it went into like Oh, each time I feel lonely or like when I feel disconnected from the world or like I'm just not having a great day or whatever, this would just be like a quick high type of thing, you know? Are you coping mechanism almost? Yes. Um, and then I actually realized I didn't really talk about that, but like with the whole hook hookup culture, like after my life got very dramatic and stuff like I just like crossed every boundary and so also when I think about it the only lesson I've really learned about sex was like don't have like vaginal sex and I actually have a very big issue with like people referring to vaginal sex as the only type of sex because oral sex is still sex and hand sex is still sex like even though you it's different it still releases the exact same um neurotransmitters in your head and so it has the exact same effect on you um so and usually when people say oh well that's not sex the only reason they're trying to say that is two things either they believe that your purity is linked to your virginity so you have to prove that you're a virgin um, and then the other thing is when you're like, oh, but vaginal sex is everything. So like, you're not really, you're still a virgin if you didn't have, yeah, if you didn't have vaginal sex, right? And both of those views are crooked and wrong. Um, but yeah. I don't know if you want to go into this in this podcast, because I feel like it's a big topic. But I remember a while back, you did post about masturbation and you were like, it was something like you believe that masturbation is fine outside of lust, but it's impossible to have without lust or whatever. I don't know mm. if you want to go into that now. Yeah, I can just like quickly summarize. Basically, people ask me whether I believe masturbation is a sin a lot. Um, and I've, yeah, my view has kind of stayed the same. And it's just like, I can't say that masturbation specifically is a sin. Um, because it's not, yes, it's not in the Bible. Some people do believe it's com like the act itself is a sin, but we know that lust is a sin. And the question is, can you masturbate without lust? And the answer is like, maybe 0.01% of the time you can, but mostly you can't. Because the argument is sometimes it's for sexual release. Okay. Especially for men. That's what they'll say. Um, I don't think Jesus did that and I think he was fine. I think you can not have a sexual release and still be fine. I think you have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? I think as Christians, we get so, and this is what I always say, I'm like, it's not about whether it's right or wrong. It's about who are you becoming? You know, the Bible isn't specifically clear like, oh, don't let your boyfriend touch your boob or like, 
Like, it doesn't say that. The question is, like, are you honoring God and the other person in this moment when you are not yet one? Is this honoring? Are you becoming more like Jesus in this? Are you becoming more like Jesus while you are masturbating? Or are you not? And if you're not, then don't do it. It's a much... The responsibility is way higher on us you know like it's so much more than this is right and this is wrong so that's kind of just like my view on that and also one more thing is why are you doing it i've seen that like with almost all my sexual encounters right like whether it was guys or girls or masturbation whatever it was always me running away from something almost you know because it became like my escape okay it was also mixed with like alcohol and weed and whatever but like all of those things kind of together were just like my escape from things instead of running to jesus with my problem so instead of like especially when i was upset and i realized this after i gave my life to jesus there was a time where i was really upset and I didn't, I didn't drink anymore. I didn't smoke anymore. And at that point, I also wasn't really sure. Like, I was still on my journey of like thinking what I see, like what is right or what is wrong and what is appropriate boundaries. And so like, when I was very upset, I would just like run to my boyfriend at the time and just like have a fun almost sex but not sex makeup session because that's fine yeah throughout all of that time you were you had your first experience or well, your first kiss with your best friend and then you had like your first kiss with the guy and high school was crazy um talk us through like throughout that like what ended up bringing you to a place where you were like i need jesus like because I'm yeah. sure that he didn't just disappear from your mind. Mm. But he, you just kind of are like, well, I believe in God. But, like, that doesn't mean I have to be a creditor. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I actually had such an issue with, like, Christians who were hypocrites. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do what I think is good. And I'm not going to judge you for doing whatever you're doing. Um, I really took it... <laughs> Honestly, it's actually, it's funny because I still loved the Bible. I didn't read it all that much, but when I did, I thought it was really cool. I loved going to Sunday school and to church. Like this wasn't like, my parents didn't force me. Like I really liked it because I liked debating theological ideas um, and trying to understand. And I always asked why. Um, and yeah i mean i even before i did like my what i don't know what you confirmation thing like i told my leaders i was like you know i like smoke and drink right but like i still love jesus but i'm doing this and they're like we're so proud of you for not lying it's like i'm not about pretending you know <laughs> but honestly i was just so lost like i was just I completely lost myself um, because my high school experience was a little bit like Gossip Girl um, time, times 13 Reasons Why season one. So like my life was just like not my own anymore and like there were so many rumors and stuff going on um, and I've always been a strong person but like I, it was just a lot, you know, like I received so much hate. I had like two hate pages on Instagram and it's just like it's not fun um and that so wait people people purposely made Instagram pages just to hate on you yes basically it's fun a fun time I mean not that I was that great to them so let me I'm not gonna say that I was great <laughs> I was very sassy and very not that nice to people so but all those things brought me more into this world of like escaping and you know what I knew throughout everything like I knew I needed Jesus but I was like the only way I can describe it 
was that like I felt like I was drowning and I was like I remember I prayed a lot of times and I was like Jesus I I know I need to like hold on to you but like I can't I can't I am actually drowning and if I like don't get drunk and like make out with this guy and do this like I am not gonna survive the rest of this year like this it emotionally it was the worst year of my life um and like by the end of high school I was pretty depressed and like there's this one there are two things that I feel like really well maybe three like it was a different a few different circumstances that made me realize oh my gosh I have to change my life um I guess the first one was I was out with my friends and um I was drinking a lot but I didn't realize it because I just didn't anyway and then my other friend came and like we smoked some weed and you everyone including me knew you shouldn't drink before you like smoke weed you should do like you should smoke first and then drink otherwise you like yeah it's not good but I didn't realize that I drank that much but anyway I did and I had the worst night like I wasn't in control of my body and I was laying under this truck and I was like I don't know I was just praying and I was like Jesus if these people like start this drug they might like kill me but I can't move like with my mind I can think how I should move but I can't physically control my body and okay my one friend was raped when I was in grade 11 and I was with her and another friend too we were at the small gathering and we were all high it was just like this whole mess and later on my parents found out and everyone freaked out and like for a long time people blamed me for it and so I was like well if I die in the like autopsy this was in my mind I was like they're gonna see I was high again and like everyone's just gonna be so disappointed because I told them I wouldn't smoke weed anymore but I did and like I was just like I don't know what I'm doing with my life like you have to help me Jesus like you have to um, so that was like a really bad moment for me, but I don't think anything changed after that, like immediately. Then two more things happened. I, um, created this cool me thing, you know, where people can ask you things anonymously. Don't know why I did that. Do not know why I would do this when people hate me so much that they've already started two hate pages. They wanted to burn down my house. Like, why would I do this? I don't know. I'm an idiot. Anyway, <laughs> I started this and I was obviously getting so much hate because now people could do it anonymously. And so I got messages like, oh, well, I'm so sad or um, I'm sorry for you that your dad rapes you at night. And like, uh, and like, it was just like so bad. And I remember like crying in my bed and I was like, Maybe I should just die and maybe they'll realize what their words mean. Like, I was just like, you know what? I'm kind of, oh, like, I'm a strong person, but I'm so weak right now. Imagine if I was, like, a weak person. And I was just, like, thinking about suicide, but I don't think I would have done it. But I was just like, I guess if I just die, then they'll realize what they did. Or, like, they'll realize how much their words mean and how you just can't say these things you know so was yeah. this did you have your blog at this time yes this was all of this was because i started this blog um which was a satire of my life and i essentially started this blog because my life wasn't my own anymore and i just needed a space where i could write down my truth um and so people didn't really love my truth. But also, honestly, midway through, it became just like a war. And I always still wrote the truth. But it was just like, it was more than just telling my story halfway through, you know. Um, so that brought about a lot. And I think the third thing what happened is like I had this friend and I told him that I was going to this Bible school thing after high school because i didn't know what ywm was youth with a mission it's a missionary organization and i did this discipleship training school 
And I, yeah, I did not know what that was, honestly. Um, so what made you decide to go then? Like, you're in matric, everything's dramatic. Yeah. Um, you don't know what you need to go to, and that's, you just wanted a gap year, or? No, I just didn't want to go to university, and I really wanted to do film. And my uncle is like, um this pretty famous um steady cam operator in cape town and i shadowed him and i was like oh my gosh i want to be a director it's gonna be so cool um and i asked him like what film school he did and he did a film school through this missionary organization because they essentially have their own university and you can do courses through them and so i wanted to do that and he was like, oh, but you have to do your DTS first. And I honestly, I just heard these terms, but I was like, I don't know what's happening. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I even like went to the campus thing and like checked it out and they told us about it. But I was just like, well, earlier in my life, there was a time I wanted to do some mission work. So like this has an outreach. I didn't thought it was a dis like I thought it was a Bible school, not a discipleship school thing. And I also thought that the discipleship part was part of the film school. Like I thought it was one long year where you did different things, right? And I didn't get like why would you combine these two things? But I also honestly didn't care because I was like, okay, well my plan for next year is sorted. Like I know where I'm going. So now I can try to just survive this year. <laughs> so when I got there, I was like, what? I was so confused, honestly. <laughs> the first two weeks, I was like, wow. <laughs> and I actually, when I went there, I planned to um, rebel. Like I was very like, I was like, I'm not going to follow these rules. I'm not going to not drink for six months. I was like, whatever i'll just rebel i always have um but then obviously that didn't work out <laughs> it's not much media in our dts yeah it should have just been dts with some people filming things <laughs> you were gonna say something about the first night about from the dts or something so for me coming to dts i knew that it was a discipleship training school because I had read some blogs before. But I'm trying to imagine, like, if I thought that it was, like, media-focused and then the first night people are, like, telling their deepest, like, this is my testimony, and then Coase comes out with his stories and then Jason's crying and Taylor walks out, like, I it must have been, like, the that. weirdest. Yes, I was so confused. Also, I came from, like, a Dutch Reformed church. So like everything was, I was like, these people are literally crazy. And also half of the things I'm saying right now, I never said in my testimony because I was like, these people are going to judge me. I'm so not going to, no. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to say this. A lot of people did leave a lot of stuff out, but I mean, we just, yeah, we were like, oh, what's your name like, again? Yep, yeah, but it, because they do it like, well, yes, you're doing it on the first day. Like, I just met these people. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? What Try to remember to your name. Now I know the deepest things about you. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, so so you were like, okay, I want to do media. Let's go do media with YWAM. <laughs> and then yes. tell us about, like, obviously, it must have been a shock, the things yes. that we were doing. And um, how that slowly I guess softened your heart and maybe changed your heart towards the course as a whole because I mean I feel like a lot of people were like no drinking for six months are you crazy I just turned 18 like I yeah. want to drink <laughs> you know but I guess uh, yeah for me age didn't really matter at that point when it comes to drinking so that was I was fine with that but like I was just I think like Two days before I went to Cape Town, I actually had this um, going away party planned. Um, and I only invited my closest friends. And like, they turned out to not be my closest friends and like bailed on me after it should have started. And someone was like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, like I'm in Cape Town. And I was like, what? I was so upset. 
because so many I was very known but I didn't consider everyone my friend and those who I considered my friends I really gave up a lot for them I was not always the best friend but because I already had a bad reputation I often made my reputation even worse to save theirs so I was very disappointed that they couldn't come this one time and so when I flew um, to Cape Town I was like you know what I hate these people like I remember even like texting them on this group that I made and I was like I just want to say you're worse than everyone who hates me because everyone who hates me hates me in front and behind my back and you are like a spineless generation and you're the problem <laughs> like I was just like mm -mm. <laughs> so when I flew away like for the first time I deleted all my chats and this was a very big thing because I used to have like dirt or receipts on everyone but I was just like I'm done I hate these people I hate this place so it was actually even though I planned on rebelling once I got to DTS and because our group was so great like honestly it was the weirdest group of people but everyone was so willing to change and grow except maybe like one but most of them <laughs> and so and so but I just kind of adapted that I was like well I know I have to make a choice like once I got there I was like okay well this is not what I expected oh my gosh it's an entire international organization like wow didn't know these things existed but I didn't like my life the way it was you know like yes there were extreme high moments but there were extreme dark times and I was like actually none of my friends were real it's like I don't want to live this life you know and so the first two weeks was an extreme adjustment because I was like, what is happening? Praying in tongues. Oh my gosh, is this real? Like, it was very weird for me, but I was also so ready for change. Like, I just knew, like, if I went down the path that I was on, like, I did not know whether I would end up where I should, you know? And then halfway through my DTS, one of my very close friends died. And, like, that was, like... I don't know that was it was so sad to me but it was like I thought two things I thought you know what if I did if I like went on the same path that I was on in high school that could have been me and the second thing was I realized oh my gosh like I need to talk about Jesus I just like I don't th like everyone was like oh well heaven gained a new angel and I was like I knew him and his heart and like yeah maybe he accepted Jesus but I don't think he did like I don't think he's in heaven and I think that's really sad and I think it's so sad that I didn't speak to him for because for three months I didn't speak to anyone like I apologized to the people I wrote about and I like didn't speak to anyone I just needed to take a breather and you know what was also great about DTS is that I didn't have to live up to the reputation I had no one knew me no one knew where I was from, what I did. Like, yes, okay, we had this brief testimony sharing thing, but like, it's different, you know? Even now, um, moving back to Pretoria, when I see people and it's four years later, some people still remind me of high school. And I'm like, yeah, it's four years later. Like, let's not, like, I'm not that person. But when people want you to be that person or hold on to this image, it's it's really hard to change. It's so hard to go into a different direction. And so I'm so thankful for that opportunity to leave all of it behind and be like, no, I'm going to reinvent myself. Who do I want to be? But the weird thing is, though, right, like I was I was so ready for change. Um, but I didn't know how it was gonna happen, you know? I was like, how am I gonna give up these things? I didn't know, like, I was I was ready for change, but I wasn't thinking about all the rules I had to follow or anything. Like, I was just kind of rediscovering what Jesus meant. Um, And then I had this one day where I, I was, like, reading John, and I was laying on my bed, and I had this supernatural encounter with Jesus' love, and it... Like, I can't describe it in words because I can't fathom that feeling. Like, it's just like, I don't know how to describe it, but it was just such a heart revelation. And that moment actually changed my entire life. Like, I, 
afterwards thinking back like um i remember after dts going out with people and like i just i didn't drink at all or i had like one glass of wine and people were so shocked but like it wasn't even effort i wasn't like oh i have to follow this rule like it was not at all like that it was just like i this encounter with jesus's love just changed my whole perspective on like what what does happiness mean like what is like what what's the meaning of life why am i here um, what is my purpose what is my role in this bigger picture you know like it just changed so radically where a lot of things that i knew with my head became hard things you know that's really good because i feel like on dts we learned a lot a lot we learned a lot <laughs> um but a lot when i look back i have a lot that i know from what they taught us but the key is for it to like go into your heart and so the fact that you could have that moment with god is so beautiful um but yeah so after dts well okay so we had the lecture phase of dts which was a lot of information a lot of learning getting to know each other and then we went on outreach um and i'm sure outreach was like a whole other experience for you if you want mm -hmm. to talk about that a little bit yeah, that was just, I mean, there's various things that outreach exposed me to. First day, it exposed me to Africa. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, we're in Africa right now. This is an entire continent. I don't know, especially because I grew up in such a white South Africa. It was like very interesting to me, you know? Um, But... It also opened my eyes, obviously, to like miracles and things like that, because we saw a lot of miracles and we prayed for a lot of people. And that was just something that like the churches I went to never like denied miracles, but they never spoke about it. Like I kind of assumed they didn't really happen anymore, you know? Um, yeah. And just like that whole experience really humbled me. Like obviously we all have pride i still have a lot of pride but like dts really broke down my pride like i was such a spoiled person <laughs> and it's funny because like when i look at like where i came from out of the like Pretoria east culture i was one of the less spoiled people like i only got a car like in like late like not when i was 18 only later on it was a second hand car and it was an old car which actually in the broader south africa like wow that's amazing so many people don't have a car but like for me i remember thinking like like everyone got like um like a mercedes or a, what's this other car that everyone has uh, it's like a girl type of car the fiat 500 maybe no it's not that i can't remember the name because i just don't care about cars that much but i'm trying to think i think sharpay drive drive drove 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 this car you know oh i don't know what that car is called you know but i mean we had the same issue like there were people at my school i was there today actually there are people in my brother's grade who are driving like convertible Porsches and like yeah. just these like fancy cars I know and then yeah as much as it's actually in the real world not normal to get a car at 18 I was like how 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 am I not like why don't I have a car right now like what is wrong no exactly what because you're so immersed and that's the only life you know so I was like oh my dad doesn't give me everything that I want why <laughs> why can't i get a new phone why i mean and i still had pretty great phones and stuff but like my dad would always give me his old stuff he would never buy me a new thing like last year for the first time ever in his life he bought me a phone and you know what he trained me so well that i didn't believe him for like 10 minutes <laughs> i was like <laughs> i was like no you're lying I was like, this is, no, no. I was like, you, you're kidding. This is not for me. He's like, no, it is. I was like, no. <laughs> like, I was so shook. I was like, this is not real. Like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, you trained me well. Um, but yeah, I was really spoiled. Honestly, I was spoiled. And like, 
I didn't vacuum. I didn't vacuum because also we don't really have carpets in the house, but still, like, I don't know. I was in the hostel also, so I only came home on like weekends, and so we didn't really clean here. And in the hostel, obviously, there are people cleaning stuff. So, like, yeah, I just, I did not realize how spoiled I was, you know, because I was the less spoiled one in the, the culture that I was in. Like going to YWAM and all these places, I was like, oh my gosh, you are so spoiled. <laughs> I was like, I was like, you are so prideful. You think you're too good to like vacuum something? What's wrong with you? And that also sucks to admit, but it's true, you know? Did you ever feel guilty for like any mental health issues or whatever that you had in your life? Because I know for me, I was like, these people are so happy. And they have like nothing. And I'm out here like, I have so much. I went to a great school. I have any clothes I need or want. Like, I've had a great life. How can I justify having struggled with like depression and stuff when I was younger? Like, my life was good. <laughs> like, mm. you know? Yeah, no, I don't think I had any guilt. I just think I it brought a lot of perspective to me again. And I was like, you just realize the more you have, the more you want to have. Um, and happiness and joy really isn't from material things, you know, like we know that, but because you're so immersed in this world, that's so obsessed with like the phone or the car or the followers or whatever you have, you realize like, um, not to say that their lives are easy, um, the people that we visited, because of course they have more basic struggles in terms of like finding healthcare stuff and things like that. Um, so I'm not gonna, but also I don't think, I don't think we necessarily have to compare lives, you know, like each pe person has their own struggles. But I do think if you're lo like less immersed in this very typical western society um you don't always have that much like stress on you obviously if you don't have food all those things that brings stress but generally you know like a lot of people they're like they have enough to eat they have but they're not constantly hungry for more so of course some of that can be cultural but also just like the society they live in they're not constantly being told that they should want more you know, we're constantly being told you're worth it. Go buy that new lipstick. Like if you want to spoil yourself, go buy that, go get that. It's not like, oh, you want to spoil yourself? Maybe you should just look in the mirror and say, you're great. <laughs> like that's not the message you get. It's like, go buy that bikini so you can look in the mirror and then tell yourself you're worth it. You know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay, so moving to a totally different topic. Um, I was thinking we can talk about, obviously you spoke about your questioning sexuality and trying things and doing things when you were younger. Then you go to YWAM and have this experience with God and you're not like, you don't need drinking or anything. Like you just, mm. you have God and what more do you really need? And how did that now start to affect your view of sexuality and your view of yourself and what you want in life. Yeah, so that's a pretty interesting story and it's not like a very smooth story. Um, basically, like <laughs> just after DTS, I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't think like you should have sex before marriage. And like, I was like, pretty convinced that I didn't want to follow the path of like um, uh, pleasing my every desire, especially when it came to like girls or same sex things. Um, and it just like felt like that wasn't God's design for us. Um, but you know what? I didn't think about it that much, honestly, like, cause, um, thinking back about it, I was not confronted with it at all. Like, because we weren't allowed to date in DTS and I didn't want to date anyone, so like, I didn't care. Um, 
But then towards the end of 2017, I got in this relationship that was very messy. And that is actually in that relationship I learned, oh my gosh, you don't know what you believe or what. Like I was like, okay. But I was still in the mindset of like, I don't want to have sex, but like, what is sex really? And I'm just going to do all these other things. And um, I realized how I did not deal with that at all because again, I didn't have to because I wasn't confronted with it. So it was like, oh, that's great for now. But then when I was in the situation, I just crossed, you know, every single boundary ever and just like, um, I mean, it's not that I thought this was a great way. I was just like, again, I was, this was now beginning 2018. I was again, pretty traumatized by life. <laughs> And I just went into my old habits because I was like, oh, well, you know, but this time I kind of brought Jesus into it, which made it a little bit more complicated and awkward, I guess. Um, like, I remember being with this guy and then he was like, oh, yeah, or something like, I don't know, he would say something about Jesus and I'd be like, yeah, Jesus is here with us. I don't think he's impressed. But anyway, like, <laughs> that was so great i guess you kind of physically go into auto mode with things like that like oh you're yes. used to going this far so you almost forget like i'm actually not supposed to go that far <laughs> this is so true it's like it is such a habit that and you know what it took me i only really broke this habit last year so the whole 2018 i we crossed a lot of boundaries again when it came to my sexuality and um towards the end of 2018 i did this bible school and that's when i really like started studying god's design for sex um and just sexuality in, ge in general and in 2019 i realized that's when i like discovered sexology as a like career option and how I can specialize in that. And I bought more books. I discovered a moral revolution, read a bunch of their things. Um, and so then I was like, oh, you know what? I, I want to live a pure life. Um, not that I, I, and it also shifted, you know, I realized, oh my God, gosh, for so long, I thought virginity is purity, but I realized purity is not virginity. Like virginity is a product of purity, but it isn't virginity specifically. Um, and my heart towards living a pure life in general, in terms of like my desires and my heart, um, it just it became a bigger desire for me to want things that God wants, um. But then I went on this date, right, and it just went too far, <laughs> and I, and I remember sitting and I tell this story pretty often. I think I've mentioned it on my podcast before, but I was sitting with my best friend and I was like, I just don't know what to do, like I just really don't know what to do because. I'm just a really like horny person. Like I don't know what to do with myself. Like <laughs> it's just a lot. What do I do with this? Yes, like I just exactly. feeling all these things, want to yeah. do all these things, but I'm not married. And she, she's not Christian though. She was just like, it's fine. It's normal. People are like that sometimes. And I was like, it's not helping, but it's okay. exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> literally. But that was such a great revelation for me because I was like, okay, here's the problem. You, that's when I was like, well, this is an automatic thing for me. It feels like when I do this, we have to do this other thing because this feels really good. And like, there's also like this one point for me where I was always like, if we, I get to this point, then I'm just like, there's no more boundaries. Like there's no going back after this. Like then it's just like, eh, what is boundaries even? Like with we're mammals like our bodies automatically do their thing you know mm. as well so it's just a bit more complicated being a human being because yeah. we also have brains so self-control is such a underrated virtue um but this guy was actually very like understanding because i was like listen no 
no mm -mm. it's not gonna happen again and like we had to set like extreme boundaries and um yeah it worked like there was points where i was like okay just don't touch me right now like just go sit on the other side of this room <laughs> just just go okay i think you should go home okay <laughs> and it sounds really funny but it wasn't because i felt like i was constantly disappointing god it was kind of like i was disappointing myself because i was like this is not who i want to be like this is not who i want to be but it feels like I don't have this control. And then I realize I do have this control, but I need to be honest with myself. And it really does not help if I put myself in the middle of this. And then I'm like, oh, well, I really don't want to do this, but I'm like halfway naked. Like what? This is dumb. And like, don't do that. You have to be <laughs> honest with yourself um, about where you're at and about your history because it plays such a big part. Like, you're expecting that all those years not like um, having any boundaries is as if it's not going to have an effect on right now. And then you have to be stricter with your boundaries. Like where you think they should be, take a step forward <laughs> and be like, no, make them. And it's not like I don't feel like I'm controlled. You know, I feel like I have more control because also I get to make wiser decisions in terms of the guys I date and like where I go with relationships because I'm very for intentional dating. Um, and it's just so much harder once you get like physically involved and like, oh no. Now I'm just like, after three days, okay, it's not gonna work. It's fine, it's fine. You're great, we can be friends. <laughs> okay, but that's good because I don't even make it to the third day. I don't even make it to the first day. <laughs> I'm like, I can already see You're just not it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's really bad. I do to... feel like trying to have self-control sexually has made me at least a lot more picky about guys because I'm like, I don't even want to give myself a chance with this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah. I do think I do think something that's maybe good to talk about is how you had this encounter with God that changed your heart and you no longer desired alcohol and weed. But that doesn't mean that everything else within you was sorted out because of this oh, experience yeah. with God. Like at some point you face something, you accidentally fall into temptation or whatever, and you realize like, oh shoot, like I actually, I had that encounter, but that like, I still have other things to work mm. on. Yeah. Because I feel like often we talk about like, I had an encounter with God and then we just expect ourselves to be perfect or expect other people to be perfect. Mm. And that's not how it works. Because I know for me, I went on DTS, had the best time of my life, so on fire for God, went to uni. And to be honest, I probably did more stuff once I was in uni after all those experiences than I did before. Mm. So, you know, like, yeah, God's love is transforming, but you're also responsible for what you do. Um, and that's not talked about. I feel Yeah, like. no, absolutely. I think this is also like a big part of my story, even though like, I didn't really struggle or like, I wasn't really tempted with like alcohol or drugs or weed or whatever anymore. Um, the whole s sexuality thing was a very long journey that I'm like literally still face, you know? Um, it's still a daily choice. Um, it's, I also this year realized there's a lot of trauma from past relationships and like even my relationship with my dad that I haven't dealt with yet because I just never really got around to it and there was always more important things um but giving your life to jesus does not sort all those things out for you like you have to walk the journey and it's not a perfect journey like honestly like i haven't dated anyone in a while like honestly this is probably the longest time i've been pretty single <laughs> like um high five yeah but I can't promise like when I date someone again, like I'm gonna stick to every boundary. Like I hope so, 
I'll try. <laughs> um, again, not because I'm afraid of God, but because I want to, that, like that's aimed at who I want to be. But I can't promise that. Like, it's just like, it's not realistic. And folding, like crossing a boundary doesn't mean you you failed or you can't try again you know like um this guy that with the whole boundary crossing thing when i was like okay now we're not gonna do that anymore um we went on like a few dates after that and we didn't cross any boundaries like it was really great and now we're actually just friends so that's great <laughs> but um you can you can make those choices like just because you crossed a boundary with someone once doesn't mean you're going to cross it every single time. But that takes intentionality. You know, if I just left it, then yeah, we're going to cross every boundary again. Like what even? But because I like had a conversation where I was like, listen, this is not who I want to be. I was like, I understand that like I allowed this and I do not blame you for this at all. But I realized that I have less self-control than I thought I did. And so this is not gonna like this is not working for me. And in fact, this guy was so respectful that he was like, you know what? This is because it was not that important to him. But he was like, because this is important to you, I'm going to like at first he respected the boundaries, but he like kind of tried to push them just like a little bit. And then I was like, no, that's not cool. And he was like, okay, I'm sorry, I was joking or whatever. And he like took extra precaution to like not cross any boundaries. And I was like, well, that's really respectful, you know? Cause even though that was not what he cared about because I did, he was like, okay, I'm not gonna like do things that I think will like tempt you. Like I respect that you understand where you're at in terms of self-control and whatever. And I also think like, it can be awkward to admit, like, I'm sorry, but I, I don't have self-control. <laughs> like, I just don't have very good self-control. So I have to put better boundaries, like, and it can be awkward. But if someone laughs at you or they're like, oh, no, but that's dumb or whatever, like, that's not the right person for you. Like, you, if that person cares about you, they'll be like, well, I'm so glad that you know this and that you're aware and that you can communicate this well, you know, and they'll respect it and hopefully help, like help you implement the boundaries that you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the last question that I've been thinking about is with testimonies, we always think like the past, like whatever, but I feel like it informs our future so much and mm -hmm. like affects who we are, who we want to be, where we see ourselves in the future. Um, so I thought maybe you could just give us a quick little snippet of like what all of that taught you and where you are now and what you hope your future is going to look like. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. That's tough. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I can't look at the present or the future and like not acknowledge my past because I just see how everything brought me to where I am right now and I totally take responsibility for like the choices I've made in my life and I do believe God has a plan for our lives but I am not someone who believes that God put me through the things that I went through just because like I really think it's because of my free will like I made these really bad choices and God can still use that for his glory, but he wasn't like, oh, I'm going to make Lorena do all these really dumb things and go through this traumatic event. Just no, do not believe that at all. <laughs> um, but I can just see, so kind of like big picture, I hope that in 10 years, I am a successful or kind of renowned sexologist. I don't necessarily want to practice that much like I might practice for a bit um, but my dream would really be to write a few books on like sexuality and really bring the bible and science together and then go around the world talking about Jesus and sex so that would be a dream 
Yeah, I would love to continue with my podcast. Um, maybe later on it can transform to not just talking about Christian things, even though I love talking about Christian things. I also have such a desire to hear people's stories um, and to talk to people who are different than me and like believe different things. Um, and so I've always just been a lover of stories. So I'd love to tell that. Um, and I can just see... You know, the, my whole journey of sexuality, you know, it, it's based on my past. It's based on me being really lost, not having good information about sexuality. And again, I'm not blaming that for my choices because I made those choices. But I do think that if I was better informed on like what sex really is and it wasn't like this taboo to topic and the only information available wasn't just that on the internet or in a book, then I would have made better choices and I could have avoided myself a lot of drama and trauma and all these things. Um, and so my heart is really to not let that happen to other people um, and to really normalize sexuality. Like um, yesterday I posted that, you know, I was, I, I was actually studying like the anatomy of the vulva and it was like in terms of pleasure and... <laughs> It's super interesting. I was like, wow, like I really hope married people like people who are having sex are reading this. But if you're not having sex, like I don't think there's anything wrong with understanding like how your vulva and your vagina works. Like that's how God created you and having the stigma the whole time. Like, oh, if you study this, you're going to have sex. No, it does not mean that I'm going to have sex. Like, I'm actually not that turned on learning about my clitoris. Like, it's not, like but kids function may turn you on but like the anatomy is actually not that beautiful um which is actually a whole other conversation because like why do we not see that part of our body as beautiful i don't know but anyway i just really have a heart for people understanding and embracing their se sexuality and by that i do not mean just have sex i do believe sex is meant for marriage but you can embrace your sexuality even if you're not having sex um and I think it's important, especially in the Christian realm. And I mean, if you didn't have all those experiences, I don't, I can't imagine that you would be so passionate about it now. Mm, um, absolutely. And so, yeah, as much as the past can suck, like it can really open up your future and like the way that you want to help other people not have the same experience. That is so true. <laughs> No, I'm really thankful for the past and I'm, I'm actually thankful for all of my experiences, even the hate I got in high school because, you know, now hate is just like not that bad for me. Like I just don't care that much. It's not fun. No one's like, oh yeah, I got another death threat. But it's like, eh. It's not going to stop you from being who you are. Exactly. And becoming who you want to be. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Well, I guess that's all. But I'm going to ask you something because um, I always ask my guests this. And even though it's weird because I'm technically now the guest, I think you should answer this question. Tell us, Sabrina, what are you chasing right now? So right now I'm, I'm kind of just chasing sharing God's heart better with people. Mm. Um, I feel like in DTS, we learned a lot about like speaking and sharing God's love and God's love and all this stuff. And I was really good at making sure people heard about it, but I was, I was a little bit, um, not, I wasn't very good at telling people about God's love in a loving way. <laughs> I was just like, as long as they hear me, I don't care how, <laughs> you know? Um, and I just feel like, especially since lockdown started, and just coming up to the end of like graduating, I've been feeling God saying like, share my heart with people. I want you to share mm. my heart with people. Um, and it's funny because the one day I was like, dang, okay, I really need to actually put this into action because God's been saying this for a while. That same morning, my mom came into the kitchen and she was like, you know, I was in prayer group earlier and I just felt the Holy Spirit telling me to tell you that like, 
you need to share your social media. Like you need to use it to like share God. And I was like, I've literally been thinking this for the last <laughs> two weeks. Like, what is this like? Uh, if so, that's not a sign, <laughs> then I don't know what is. Yeah, exactly. And I, oh, actually there was someone else as well because I started this like prayer challenge with some people from my connect group. Um, and I shared something that I read from a book and she was like, you should be a pastor. Like you should talk about this online a lot more or whatever. So God has definitely been speaking about sharing his heart. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to chase at the moment. And that's also amazing. just success. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Success. Just, yeah, that's just success. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, because I had a lot of plans, right? Like I had jobs booked, I had festivals booked, I knew like exactly what I was going to do this year. Everything changed. So I'm just like, whatever it looks like, as long as I make a success of today, it'll add up to success in the future, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Amen. But thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for allowing me to share and for asking such great questions. You're the bomb. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. See you next time on season two of the Chasing Something podcast. Okay. Share it with your friends. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you.